Hello, my name is Nathaniel Haynes, and this is a pre-recorded presentation for the 2021 meeting for the Society of Mathematical Psychology. And today I'll be presenting my work on the role of reward and punishment learning in externalizing adolescence, a joint generative model of traits and behavior. The outline, I'll begin just describing what externalizing psychopathology is and how it develops over time. And then I'll discuss two and two here how reinforcement learning mechanisms can help us explain how these externalizing behaviors come to be. And then at the end, we'll develop a joint model of externalizing traits and behaviors to test some uh, key theories involved in this research. To begin, when I talk about externalizing, basically what I'm referring to are our psychological disorders characterized by high trait impulsivity. And trait impulsivity is an individual difference characterized by a preference for immediate over delayed rewards, uh, failures to plan ahead or consider the consequences of one's actions, and difficulties with self-control or regulating impulses. And here we see the latent dimensions of trait impulsivity and what we call emotion dysregulation, which is essentially how well we can regulate emotions. Uh, but we don't observe these in reality, and what we do observe are behavioral syndromes, or in this case these are DSM's uh, uh, diagnoses and other symptoms. And here, in childhood, how trait impulsivity manifests often is through attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, specifically the hyperactive impulsive presentation and not the inattentive presentation. But then this can develop onto further and more severe externalizing disorders depending on the dynamics of one's environment and the types of things that they're uh, exposed to over the course of development. And so another thing that's important to keep in mind here is that although we don't show it in the top panel, is some previous research has shown that anxiety can actually be protective in some cases. Um, and this is evidenced by, in children with uh, externalizing disorders, anxiety predicts things like less police contacts, uh, people getting better along uh, with their peers, as well as better responses to treatment, among other outcomes. And so the basic inference here is that the mapping between underlying traits uh, or mechanisms and behavioral syndromes is rather complex. And it depends not only on multiple traits and interacting to produce behavior, but also how the environment is interacting with a person over the course of development. And so then one way we can actually tackle some of these questions is to think of uh, dynamic models that can give rise to behavior across time. And I think a really good starting place for this is Sage uh theory called the dynamic developmental theory. And this theory essentially proposes that dopamine, or specifically hypofunctioning dopamine in the brain, is what leads to the behavior's characteristic of uh, externalizing psychopathology and ADHD in particular. And the basic idea is based on a history of work going back to Wolfram Schultz's work in Macaque Monkeys in 1997. And here in the top panel, what I'm showing you, each row here is a dopamine neuron being recorded in a monkey. And the dots are spikes, so when the dopamine is firing. And then this bar right here is an unexpected reward. And what happens is when this unexpected reward is shown, all these dopamine neurons begin to spike simultaneously. Um, and so that being said, what actually happens is if you pair this reward with some stimulus that predicts it, so this condition stimulus down here, and you do this repeatedly, you know, it could be a tone, a light, a stimulus of some sort, uh, what happens is that the dopamine begins to respond to the predictor of the reward and not to the reward itself. Uh, however, if you show the stimulus, uh, the dopamine responds, but then you withhold the reward, you see a dip. And so we call these the positive and negative prediction errors. And what's really interesting about this is that we can actually build computational models that can capture these dynamics quite well. And here's an example where, if I direct your attention to this control column, this is essentially just remaking that figure but more simple. So at the beginning here we have a bar that represents a stimulus, and then the gray dot at the end represents a later reward. And what happens is that with repeated pairings over time, uh, this model learns to expect the later reward at the time that the stimulus is shown. And what I've done is I've also made this what we call the ADHD uh, model, and the only difference here is that the ADHD model has a lower learning rate, and so it's simply taking longer for the model to learn the association between the stimulus and the later reward. And what you can actually do is from this, if we make the assumption that people's preferences for immediate over delayed rewards are derived from their actual experience with different delays, uh, we can actually derive a discounting curve that resembles what we might see in other tasks, such as the delay discounting task. And so for example, if we look at this control panel here, a discounting factor of one means that I'm assigning full value to the reward. And then with an increasing delay, what you can see is eventually the value of the reward diminishes and eventually 
reaches zero further out into the future. And what you can see here is that the ADHD model actually begins to diminish much sooner, uh, representing a steeper discounting curve or a, more of a preference for immediate over delayed rewards. And so it's in this way that dopamine or this hypo functioning dopamine system, uh, which should be related to this lower learning rates in the task, uh, can actually give rise to immediate, a preference for immediate over delayed rewards. So one of the questions that drove this research is, are individual differences in trait impulsivity and anxiety actually related to reward and punishment learning? So we looked at this in a group of 207 adolescents, ages 12 through 19. Uh, 66 of them were controls, uh, 134 and uh, 74 were diagnosed with externalizing and internalizing disorders respectively, and 67 of those in, those, in that group uh, were actually comorbid. And to look at behavior, we use what we call the passive avoidance learning task. And this is a task that resembles many of the forearm bandit tasks that are used in decision science and cognitive science, where in this task, as opposed to choosing among the different stimuli, you're shown there are four different cues, and on each trial, one is presented to you, and your decision is actually to go or no-go. So you either flip it over or not. And unbeknownst to the participants, two of the cues are probabilistically associated with rewards when you actually flip them, and two are probabilistically associated with uh, punishments or losses when you flip them. And so the task is essentially to learn which cues should I flip versus which should I ignore or passively avoid. And so for example, you might flip this and receive five points, you might lose five points, or you might win or lose a variety of other monetary amounts. And then to look at traits, uh, trait impulsivity and anxiety, we have data on a variety of different self-reports. And what I've done here is the ones in red are color-coded to reflect that a priori we believe they should be associated with trait impulsivity, whereas the blue ones should be associated with trait anxiety or internalizing. Um, some of them overlap, uh, like the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, but we have many different questionnaires covering everything from ADHD, uh, callous unemotionality, aggression, uh, irritability, alcohol use, cannabis use, depression, and anxiety. Now, to analyze the behavioral data, we use this model called the Outcome Representation Learning Model, which is a model that I developed in a previous study. Um, and this was actually developed in the context of the Iowa Gambling Task, which is a four-armed bandit task, not unlike the Passive Avoidance Task. And importantly, for the current study, there are five free parameters estimated for each person. Uh, but for us, we were most interested in the learning rates here, so the reward and punishment learning rates. And uh, there are some other parameters we won't really get into those right now, uh, but you can check out this paper if you're interested. And so in this task, uh, or in the, for this study, we actually uh, analyzed data from the IGT with a bunch of different groups, uh, a control group, a group with chronic amphetamine and with chronic heroin use. And I just want to show here, uh, green here is an optimal deck, and it's showing that the controls in this past study learned to prefer the optimal deck, whereas the substance use groups uh, do not. And when we actually compared the group level model parameters after fitting this model to the groups, we found that this negative learning rate was lower in the substance use groups relative to the control group. And so this was able to describe why these participants develop a preference for a non-optimal deck and they don't unlearn it over the course of the trials. Uh, and so we expected to find something similar in this study, but we were looking at it in terms of individual differences with trait impulsivity as opposed to a group difference. And one of the motivations for pursuing an individual differences approach is that uh, work uh, led by uh, Holly Sullivan Tool and Tom Olino, uh, who I'm working with at, at Temple University, uh, we applied this model in a test retest setting to undergrad students separated by a one month test retest window and found that the model parameters are actually relatively stable over time, especially compared to the sort of summary statistic of the average number of good versus bad decks selected in the task. And so we're relatively certain that this is something that we should be able to correlate with traits and find something meaningful. Now to look at the traits, what we actually used here was uh, an item response theory model, in particular a multi-dimensional graded response model. And so the graded response model is important because these are ordinal Likert scales, so all of these have multiple response categories. And uh, the multi-dimensional piece is important because there's evidence, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that impulsivity and anxiety actually interact to give rise to behaviors. And so we can actually capture that with this multi-dimensional IRT model, where sometimes having a high impulsivity may lead to a behavior that a high anxiety might actually diminish, or it could actually work together and they could be synergistic. And so for this, each person has a latent impulsivity and anxiety trait, uh, 
Uh, but then we have item level parameters for the difficulty, for the different response categories, and then there are actually two discriminability parameters for each item, one for each of the latent dimensions. And here I'll just give you the index numbers down here. I know it's quite uh, there's quite a lot of information here, so I apologize for that. But the basic idea is that uh, this first term in the model is the cumulative probability of responding above uh, the specific response threshold. And then the left or the right term is the probability of responding above the next threshold. And so when we take the difference, what we get at the very end is a probability of responding within a response category. So to each of the uh, item response categories for each item. And now what we did to look at individual differences is we developed a joint model across the ORL and MGRM and basically we can assume that the thetas and the computational model parameters all follow from a multivariate normal distribution with a mean vector, so a mean for each parameter, and then a covariance. And this covariance can actually be decomposed into the variances of each uh, group level parameter as well as the test re or the the individual difference correlation. And here is where we actually obtain our correlation estimates of the relationships between impulsivity, anxiety, and the model parameters. And this is all accounting for measurement error that we would otherwise have if we were to, say, take point estimates of the scores and correlate them post hoc. Now, first off, for the results, I'm going to show you posterior predictions for the observed versus uh, predicted data at the group level for the behavioral task. And here, stimulus 1 and 2 are stimuli that a participant should learn to choose, so they're probabilistically associated with winning when you choose them, whereas 3 and 4 are probabilistically associated with loss when choosing them. And so participants should learn to go on 1 and 2 and learn to avoid 3 and 4. And on average, that's what we see. So these red dots are the averages uh, on each trial across participants, the average number of participants or the proportion of participants that chose go. And what we see is that the model predictions that are in the, the bigger circles, the softer red color, and the uncertainty intervals, uh, the model on average is able to capture this trend relatively well. There's some misfit at the beginning uh, suggesting a potential go bias, um, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that to anyone who's interested after the fact. Um, but in general, they learn to prefer the good decks and learn to avoid the bad ones. And that was at the group level, but also the results are relatively consistent at the individual level, where even rather complicated uh, dynamics, so for this person, they they quickly learn that this is an optimal uh, cue to no-go on, but then they do some experimenting, recognize that it's bad again, and then begin to no-go uh, once again. And the model captures that rather well. So both the person and the group level results uh, come back pretty well. And now we can also show the same thing, but for the sum scores on the self-report measures. And so here are for the impulsivity scales. And essentially, we, we do OK here. One of the biggest areas of misfit is particularly here on the QDIT, which is a cannabis use measure. Uh, the audit, the alcohol use, is actually relatively OK. So we could have added another dimension to capture substance-specific behaviors. Um, but we actually decided not to just for this application. That's something I might want to explore in later research. And then similarly, here are the results for the trait anxiety, where overall, I think we did a little better for the trait anxiety or the internalizing dimension. Um, and as you can see, all of these are captured relatively well. OK, and so now the main interest was the correlations between the behavior and the trait. And what we found, so here I'm showing you on the x-axis is the estimated correlation. 0 is the dotted line, and I'm showing you for the model parameters, and then for each of the traits. And what we found, which was important for this study, was that uh, impulsivity was negatively correlated to both of the learning rates, uh, in addition to how likely a person is to choose the frequently winning decks. And so this was predicted by theory. This was more uh, sort of a, a, a finding that we did not expect, um, but then we did not see any uh, any strong correlations between anxiety and the different model parameters, and there are a few reasons for that. I don't have time to get into them, but um, if you're curious, I'd be happy to talk about that later. And one of the things that we can actually do with this is that I can say, well, let's look at the people's behavior who have really high thetas or high impulsivity and really low thetas or low impulsivity. And what you can see in particular for the stimuli three and four, which are the ones that people should learn to no-go on, uh, is that the people with low impulsivity do a relatively good job and they're relatively consistent at, at doing so. And that's less the case for those with high impulsivity. So it seems like the passive avoidance is, uh, is, is a little bit more difficult for the high impulsivity uh, participants relative to the low impulsivity participants. <laughs> 
Okay, so another thing that we can look at is, is the uh, discriminability parameters for each of the items in the self-reports in particular. And what we should see here is that we should see high discriminability for self-reports with a congruent dimension. So all of these self-reports here should indicate impulsivity and they do have these high discriminabilities. But what's important, because this is multidimensional, actually a discriminability can be positive or negative for each of these dimensions. And so for example, the irritability measure, uh, anxiety also positively contributes to irritability in addition to impulsivity. Uh, Similarly, with alcohol use, it looks here, so impulsivity predicts more alcohol use, but so too does higher anxiety. Whereas in some cases, having lower anxiety actually predicts uh, less impulsive or less endorsing of higher categories, like for this aggression questionnaire. And so you, with these multidimensional IRT models, we can actually capture some of those interesting interactions. All right, and so the general conclusions here are that we found that both reward and punishment learning rates were negatively related to trait impulsivity, which was predicted by the dynamic developmental theory based on some of those findings that I described at the beginning. And this can actually give us a future direction to explore why preference differences arises, uh, in particular, why people learn to prefer a media over delayed rewards. We also found that reward and punishment frequency sensitivity was negatively associated with trait impulsivity. Uh, that wasn't predicted a priori, and that's something I want to explore more in the future. Uh, and then also we found that trait impulsivity and anxiety, or externalizing and internalizing, uh, jointly contribute to a variety of different, what we might call impulsive or anxious behaviors or symptoms at the observable level. And that was shown at the very end there. Okay, so that sums up my talk. Thanks a lot for coming, and I just wanted to give a shout out to my co-authors on this work. So thanks all for coming, and I uh, look forward to any questions that you might have.